โทสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสนะโมทัสสะมะคะวะโทอะระหะโทสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสนะโมทัสสะมะคะวะโทอะระหะโทสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะพุทังธรรมังสังขังนมัสสะมิเราไม่ได้ไปอยู่กับสิ่งนั้นเราไม่ได้ไปอยู่กับสิ่งนั้นเราไม่ได้ไปอยู่กับสิ่งนั้นเราไม่ได้ไปอยู่กับสิ่ง
we're, we're saying something about it, we're adding something onto it, uh, which usually is, conveys one's own opinion and one's particular bias and view. You know, well, I've seen more beautiful chrysanthemums than that. That's a, you know, I've seen, uh, I was at the garden show the other day and it was, I saw a most, much better chrysanthemum than this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't like chrysanthemums. I much prefer roses. Whatever. There's something extra added on from our own personal world that we create. But as, uh, as when the mind is, is say, when we know the difference, when we see the Dhamma, then we see the the, the Dhamma of beauty and of the, and the, and and it speaks to us in its own right for what it is. We're not expecting it to speak from the position of being the most perfect chrysanthemum ever grown on this planet. But from whatever it has to offer, it's offering to us. It, we're receptive to its message in whatever state it happens to be in. Like now, these, these roses aren't so beautiful now today, are they? Pretty droopy. Yesterday they were vibrant like that. Now they're like that. So when we, when we, you know, those roses that had it, it's, it <laughs> <laughs> throw them out. You know. <laughs> Anything I can't stand is a wilted rose. <laughs> they don't like, roses never last very long, do they? Not like chrysanthemums. <laughs> <laughs> chrysanthemums just seem to stay that way for ages and get tired of them. But <laughs> But even in its droopy stage, it's still, if we're, if we're not caught up in our own world, creating a world, our own views around it, then also it's, it, has, it has something that's offering to us in, in con- to consciousness of it. Because the whole process of, from birth to death, from the arising to the maturing to the full flowering to the fading to the rotting and all that. There, that's all Dhamma to us when the mind is free from this creating a world out of desire and fear. And then, and then when the mind is free, then everything is Dhamma for us, the whole process of life. Evil is Dhamma and good is Dhamma and, and birth, newborn babies and, and uh, old uh, senile uh, people and, and uh, cripples and healthy people and men and women and, and everybody, everything is Dhamma rather than something that I have opinion, strong opinions about and prefer, prefer this over that. As a, on a personal world that we create, then we have strong opinions about all kinds of things. You can see we live in a time where people really express all their opinions quite openly. So we have, you know, endless conflicts and and disagreements because people have different ways of looking at things and, and, uh, and then the opinions, you know, differ and then we become angry and upset over, uh, we're fighting um, from two different worlds. Sounds like one of those soap operas, doesn't it? We come from two different worlds. <laughs> I remember seeing one of the a Chinese film when I lived in, in Southeast Asia, a kind of melodramatic Chinese film produced in Hong Kong, the story of this Chinese artist who falls in love with a Japanese woman. And the classic line was, uh, it can never be. We come from two different worlds. <laughs> You're Japanese and I'm Chinese. <laughs> no, in a way, that's true. When one is putting emphasis on, on, uh, on those kind of issues, then there is, a, there is definitely two different worlds we have to deal with. And if we don't know that, then we tend to be endlessly frustrated and, and annoyed by life. Because 
we somehow think maybe our world is what everybody's world should be. The way I see everything is, is the way I assume everyone else sees everything, or should. And then you, you feel uh, angry or upset or indignant by the fact that people don't always see it uh, or agree with the, the way you see the world or the world you've created. Because the real world, the quote, real world, unquote, is our world, isn't it? When people talk about, say, accuse uh, us here, uh, Samana Zaramavati, of not living in the real world, it means that we don't live in their world, which is real for them. (laughs) What they mean, isn't it? Because they regard their world as real and our world as not being real. But any of the worlds are unreal. They're all illusory worlds. Because then we, when we see in the right way, then we see Dhamma rather than create a world. We can still use conventions, uh, but the conventions then are coming from wisdom rather than from ignorance. So one can still use the English language and, and, uh, and English conventions and so forth but it's, it's then not just a, a, a habitual conditioned reaction to life that we're using social conventions or language, but it's skillful use of these conventions for what is, what is true and good and beautiful rather than to divide and separate and uh, create endless, endless delusions around ourselves and in the minds of others. our minds tend to be very conditioned with ideals so that uh, we have, we expect a lot from life, actually, most of us, because we have these ideals. Um, And this is just a reflection for you, just just to, so you can contemplate your own, uh, what what suffering is for you. If this helps, then, then then use it. But, like the ideals that we have uh, for how life should be. It's like dem- democratic systems and communism and socialism are all based on very high-minded ideas. Uh, now even though one uh, has been brought up as an American, which means you are brought up to hate communism and regard it as the, uh, the f- focus of evil in the world, uh, and uh, think it's just totally evil. Actually, when you examine communism and, and what it was, its original purpose and, and what Marx had in mind, it's very idealistic. That it's to try to, to bring a kind of perfect society into being, perfectly equal and fair society into being, where nobody is, is preferred, everybody is equal and, and all things are shared and there's, no, there's nothing you know, eventually to that ideal state where, where we're all, uh, you know, perfectly happy living in a perfect society where everything is perfect and, and uh, there's no unfairness, injustice, inequality at all, say, the ideal goal. But then look what happened when it was imposed upon a country of people a group of people, and it became a tyranny, didn't it? it be, and rather than being a liberating system, it became an oppressive one. Why? Why didn't it, why didn't it liberate when it's, such, when it's based on such high-minded views and, uh, and ideas? And then we realize that, that high-minded ideas, if imposed on anyone, become a tyranny. It's like morality, isn't it? If, if, if I, if I uh, the, what we most fear about the word morality is the kind of old puritanical Victorian version where, uh, you know, you, you have to keep 
you have to be moral, otherwise you're go- God's going to punish you. Fire and brimstone, eternal damnation, the most horrendous uh, uh, things that God does to you for being immoral. So if you really want to get out of that, you have to be moral. So, so that even though morality is a good thing, uh, it becomes oppressive. We feel oppressed by it. Everybody telling us what we have to do. And, uh, and we, we don't know how to cope with our feelings or instinctual nature at all. We don't, we're just told that they like sexual desires or this is wrong or bad or dirty or, or that these impulses we feel and so <coughs> forth are, are evil and if we follow them the devil's going to get us and we're going to burn for eternity in hell. So morality becomes moralistic rather than a liberating convention, it becomes something that oppresses us, something that makes us kind of hip, uh, frightened and hypocritical about everything. Because we, we might be doing those things, but we, we don't want anyone to know. Everything is under cover, behind the curtain, and the pretense of being moral and upright is, the, is what we show to the world. You know, the, the image is... is because we, we don't want to be criticized or threatened by the, by the, by the vicar <laughs> or the neighbors, you know, watching out through the curtains, the lace curtains, to see who went in the house and who, who comes out early in the morning and all this. So, <laughs> so that we, people are looking. When, you're, when you've been oppressed by morality, you can't help but get a kick out of watching other people be immoral. <laughs> Not much, you know, you really can't do it as a kind of honest kind of enjoyment of pornography. You have to kind of do it in a kind of, you know what I saw. <laughs> Isn't that disgusting? Oh, it's dreadful. Isn't that dis- what did what, what did what did she do again? <laughs> Isn't that disgusting? (laughs) (laughs) At that time, we were all pretty high on being disgusted. (laughs) (laughs) Because it becomes a kind of hypocrisy. And that's what we we feel it's dishonest, isn't it? We feel it's oppressive. Morality is then tainted with that kind of perception. But when you when you're presenting morality as a reflection and as a way, to, a, a way to understand things, then we see it as something that helps us. And that's what it's meant to do. It's meant to be a help for us. It's a tool for helping us to develop and act in the right way, in ways that are skillful and good and a benefit to ourselves and others. So then we enjoy it. We love morality because it, it's happy. It makes us respect, it allows us to respect ourselves and to feel good about our lives. And it's not oppressive. It's not, uh, doesn't bring out mean, n- uh, nasty uh, states of mind or, hypo- or hypocrisy. Because it's, it's coming from the heart from, and from an understanding of its use and its purpose and a, an appreciation for it. Because even though we've made evil look like it's very tantalizing, and that somehow you have, have uh, I remember in my youth, they used to have s- pop songs on the radio where uh, some kind of vampish voice would come out singing about how, how uh, you know, how I want to be evil, or I want to... You know, this kind of kind of attractive glamour of, around evil, uh, fascinating and interesting, and and it, and of course, one when you're young, you think, yeah, evil is a lot more interesting than goodness, isn't it? I mean, it's something about doing something sinful that's kind of exciting, <laughs> but doing something good is you know, doesn't doesn't excite you, because. In our society, sin and evil, these things, immorality, is oftentimes made to even appear quite glamorous. 
and uh, and it's, it's a way to really ex- assert yourself and be free to do all the things that nobody a- else dares do. But on further reflection, when you when you reflect on evil actions, and that then you realize that there's that uh, that uh, evil thought or evil actions or speech, there's something in us that we can't respect. We lose respect for ourselves. And we, and we create uh, a life around, we create division and mistrust around us. How can you trust anyone who, who is immoral? Isn't it? Your measure of trust uh, falls away in confidence in them because, you know, say, say uh, just the second precept of stealing. How can you trust anyone who you know steals? It might be, uh, you know, they might be proving their free spirit to do what they want, but in a society where you have to live with each other, you, all you can do is feel when a thief comes into the room is, where did I put my... <laughs> did you lock the door? <laughs> because they create around them that, that feeling of mistrust, and, the, and then their self-respect also is, they have no way to respect themselves because they've not done the thing, they've not acted and lived in a way that is worthy of respect. And so they tend to create just problems wherever they go, difficulties around themselves. Where I say a moral life is, is, is done in such a way that we find a joyousness in, in it. It's not boring and dull and just for kind of silly old people are afraid to do evil because they might be sent to hell by the devil. It, you know, it's not just the kind of wimpish straits of the world that, <laughs> that are good, but it, goodness has a, has a beautiful result. It, it brings joy into our lives. At least I find it so. To be good is an, is an honor and it's something that one loves loves to do the good and uh, and one feels grateful that one can do good that one has uh, has the the opportunity the occasion and the possibility for doing good things and then one reflects on on the result of things that one has done that are not good and it it leaves an unpleasant memory in your mind doesn't it we have to experience a guilt and remorse and and also the karmic result of say that comes up and might you know uh, overwhelm us in, in our lives, just having lived selfishly or foolishly, and uh, and uh, then we have to bear the consequences of the karma of those actions. But good actions always leave a good result. So I mean, uh, in immediate terms, if you if just thinking a good thought makes you feel good. If you're really aware, if you're really thinking good in a, in a, and, and meaning it, at that moment you feel very good because it's a, it, the result is that immediate. And then as we live in a way that we respect ourselves, then people will respect us and, we, and people like to have us around. People in, enjoy having good people to live with, unselfish, kind, generous people to live with. It's a, it's a joy, it's a pleasure to live in a community where people are that way, like here in the monastery. It's a very pleasant community to live in because people are really value that goodness and they try to be very good and to try and they're very generous and kind. So, and this is a very pleasant, because of that, it's a very pleasant community to live in. One is, it doesn't find it uh, a place, like I travel a lot, and I always enjoy, look forward to coming back here, to being with the monks and nuns again. I enjoy their company, I enjoy living with them. Uh, where if, if they were a bunch of quarreling oafs, uh, I'd do everything I could to stay away. <laughs> it wouldn't be 
nice thought to have to come back here and everybody kind of at each other and and uh, in fact one is trying to figure out how to stay here more because uh, I'm getting older and I'm not particularly love traveling anymore but the more I figure out how to stay here give more time to Amravati the more invitations I get <laughs> to go away Respecting yourself is uh, is a necessary uh, ingredient for the holy life. And in America, I was noticing how many idea of self-respect oftentimes comes not through any through understanding uh, real understanding uh, or living in a way that you respect, but in going to a psychoanalyst. So you get in a, in California anyway people who are endlessly going to therapies and, and, and through psychoanalysis so that they can like themselves. So that they, they tend to spend lots of money and do all kinds of things to, to have the feeling, I really love myself. And people will come out like that. They don't so prone to talk like that here in Britain. But in California, then somebody will come out and tell you now, so you don't even know their name. They say, I really love myself. <laughs> Who's that? (laughs) I really like myself. It's more like they're trying to convince you of something than the real kind of respect for yourself. But just endlessly thinking about yourself and figuring yourself out in 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 concepts and words through analysis uh, has has can be of help in one level, but it does not allow you to respect yourself. As long as you're paying money to a psychiatrist to sit there and listen to your endless (laughs) regurgitations of your problems (laughs) and and all you're thinking about is yourself and then my father my mother and, and then then, but you're, and maybe you're working hard to pay because the psychiatrist is very expensive so you're making lots of money to, to pay this man or woman to listen to you for an hour once or twice a week but you still are going to be left without self-respect isn't it? because that's not worthy of respect is it? to, to sit around and talk about yourself and your faults and expect somebody else to kind of do something for you, or, or uh, that. So, what is worthy of respect? What is it that you really respect in yourself or in others? And so, uh, this is from this is how I see it anyway. Is like like being moral is worthy. I respect people who really are moral and good, who do who try to refrain or restrain themselves from doing harmful or saying harmful or divisive things, who are trying to not act on malicious intentions or selfishness. Those kind of people I respect. And when I'm like that, I respect myself, even though there's no self. (laughs) (laughs) But on a conventional level, uh, I respect that. When I I refrain from doing and acting in selfish ways, and in ways that are cause harm or disruption or confusion to others, or out of conceit or pride and stupidity. Uh, being generous and kind, isn't it? When we're, when we're giving, when, we're, when we give things to others, and out of just loving to help and serve and, and uh, offer, make offerings to others, then that, that I respect that in me which, which loves to give to others and serve others. I respect that. I don't respect myself when I think others should be serving me. You should, you should be serving me. And what have you done for me? I've given, look at all I've given you. What have you done for me? And that, that, that kind of thing is not worthy. I don't respect that, when, even though sometimes those thoughts 
are not absent from my mind. <laughs> they, it's not, it's not anything I respect uh, in myself. I mean that I would want to say, follow that up and make my and think of myself as being worthy of somebody else's respect. So say in in the basis of religious life is the dana sila or or the uh, generosity, uh, charitableness, and morality are the very foundations of the holy life. Because this is where, when you when you're kind and generous, unselfish and moral, then you find you have a respect for yourself. You won't have to go to a psychologist and uh, and try to uh, think to yourself that that you love yourself anymore because you can actually like yourself or respect yourself uh, because of the way you're living and what you're doing and and how you're living your life is worthy of respect. So that's that's a reflection on. On, on how on what how to respect yourself, the importance of that as a as a foundation for uh, liberation, enlightenment. Now ours is a time where we we tend to demand rights. Aren't we we this is the age where everybody's demanding their rights. So everybody is going over the top demanding rights. And everybody thinks they have rights, and, and and is demanding them. So, but this is not really worthy of respect, is it? It's uh, it's it's understandable that everybody should want rights, but as a as an actual mental thing in your mind, when I think I have my rights, I want my rights, uh, and and this I I I listen to that, and I don't particularly respect it. Because I, I don't I don't like the sound of it. It's not something I that I, that arouses inspiration in me when I hear it in others or in in myself. What what I res- what what inspires me is what what can I do to serve? How can I help? What can I offer? Like when somebody comes into Amravati and and they say. What can I do to help? What can I offer the community? That is something you say, oh, that person is really glad to have them. Somebody comes in here demanding their rights, you think, what a pain in the neck. So, <laughs> so you, you really uh, see that, that, that demanding rights for yourself may be, uh, you know, have its point, but as a religious path, it doesn't work. We don't need rights. Uh, but we need uh, morality. We need to respect ourselves. We need to, because the holy life is not, is not uh, the obstacles of holy life are not not because of lack of rights, but because lack of morality or of kindness and generosity, uh, selfishness and conceit are the obstacles to the holy life. And that's that. Those are the only. Those are the real obstacles to the holy life. So that's a reflection for you to consider, because because uh, being an American, um, one uh, has been brought up to to think one has all kinds of rights, and uh, and the, these rights are very important to Americans, uh, so that we. We're, we're never satisfied because we always want more rights, and we'll, we always think uh, that that rights are the most important thing for us. And morality is sometimes totally ignored. In fact, we have a right to be immoral <laughs> in America, isn't that? I have my right to do what I want, uh, and and I'm going to do what I want because it's my right. It's the land of freedom. Uh, I have the right to happiness, it says. So, so I can do what I want, because doing what I want, I think I'm going to be happy if I can do everything I want. And how it affects you, if, if none of, you know, it's none of your business what I do, because I'm a free, independent person with my rights. 
demanding my rights. And this, of course, is a very kind of immature emotional state. You never grow up if that's where you're stuck, if that's the way you, you feel and look at life from that position of demand uh, on the world, on others. So that the maturing, say, uh, of an individual human being is, is no longer a demand, but an, a willingness and a joy in serving and helping and in doing the good and refraining from doing the bad. That is where we, we find our fulfillment as an active living member of a family, of a society. contemplating the world that we create, or the con- conditioned realm, the conditioned dhammas. We can contemplate the, 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 the fact that, that the sensory world is an irritating one. Its, its nature is, is irritation, agitation, things contact the senses and the body. I mean, there's, there's the, the sensitive form here that's living and breathing and is always feeling something or other. And that's an irritation to the mind. And that no matter, uh, if, as, as long as you're reacting to irritation, you, you can't have concentrated mind because you're, you're always feeling some kind of discomfort or, or something, if you, you know, the idea of concentrating your mind, getting your samadhi, you close your eyes, plug up your ears, go to a sensory deprivation tank, in a cave, anywhere, where, where you have the least amount of irritation coming at your, your body and senses. And then when you're, when you're not being irritated so much, then you can get a level of tranquility that comes through not just being irritated by everything. So this is, this is uh, say, the, the, the samatha practices of concentrating the mind. Oftentimes we have to go off to, to places where we can kind of control the environment and, with, and try, to have, try to control it so that there isn't a lot of irritating impingement on us. But then... When, we, when we're reflecting on the way things are, we recognize that, that it's actually, the, it's naturally irritating. It's not a condemnation of the sensory realm, but its very uh, existence and quality uh, is irritating to us. It irritates the mind. So, in reflecting in that way, as seeing that not as a complaint, not as a put down of the world, but merely as a, as a reflection for the mind. What is irritation? And you realize that you're constantly being irritated. You're too hot, too cold, hunger, uh, having to go to the loo, uh, and just the the uh, pain in the body, if you sit too long, you feel uncomfortable, if you stand too long, if you walk too much, if you l- even lay down too long, you feel irritated. Uh, the way we don't feel any irritation is by sleeping. Sometimes we get addicted to sleep because we, we don't, aren't consciously being irritated at that time. Or drugs and drink are certainly tempting ways of, of kind of, of uh, say, getting beyond the petty irritations, then not only, on the, we, we, not only do we feel irritation through the senses, but through, through our minds. We irritate our minds all the time with, I don't like this, I don't like that, and, and I, this wasn't right, and I don't, I don't approve of this, and why did you ever say that? And we've got inner, inner tyrants or nags. There can be an ongoing critic inside one's mind. And this is irritating to sit here and then the, the critic starts going, you shouldn't have said that. 
Mm-hmm. Not good enough. No, no, no. You're too late. You don't put enough effort in. Who do you think you are? No, 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 no. Then it goes in when you start losing, when you're getting really sleepy on an all night sitting, you kind of, it becomes less rational and more kind of balmy. <laughs> Things just don't make sense at the while. You think you're going bonkers. So that having a retentive memory, having to remember things, is, can, we can create that into an irritation for us, which I would say a, 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 an animal doesn't have because they don't, they don't have retentive memories. Just like the, the story of the sheep with the, with the lamb being taken away and the, the wail, uh, the cry of the, of the of the you, the loss of her her baby, her little lamb, and she felt the same anguish or great sorrow of separation from the love. But the next day, she couldn't remember it. <gasps> Where if you do that to a human woman, they'll never forget it. It will become a, a kind of a neurotic obsession. It can make them co- totally ruin their whole lives. If you, if you yanked a, a human baby away from a mother, like they do lambs from ewes, the human woman would, would remember it. So she'd suffer the rest of her life. If, if she, you know, she didn't practice Dhamma, she would, be, she would remember that and become maybe obsessed by the memory. Whereas they, the, the you, wouldn't remember. But would it still experience the same grief that the human woman would experience? This is a reflection for you. The, the wail and cry of anguish of the you was exact, had the same anguish, sorrowful, grief-stricken quality as what you imagine a human woman to have at the same, uh, under the same circumstances. Totally heart-rending scream and cry. And yet, the difference would be, after that would be, one would, wouldn't remember and the other would. So our memory is, in many ways, a great gift, but it's also an endless torture to us, isn't it? Because we remember it. Something horrible like that is hard to forget. You talk to people who've been in the uh, Nazi prison camps during, under Hitler, and it's really something, you know, they, they can never forget the horrors and the brutality that they witnessed and experienced. Where if it were a sheep, it would probably would be dead by now. <laughs> <laughs> don't live very long, but we live quite long lives, actually. So, this is, this is uh, what, what we, because we have this memory, then it's very important to, to be very careful and live our lives in ways that we, at least, we're not doing things, horrible things that we'll have to remember. Because we remember, we remember usually the bad things, the very best and the very worst. What we tend to not remember is just the ordinary things. Remember the great successes, and we, and we also we remember a lot of uh, any failure or, or humiliation or unpleasantness. I mean, if, if especially if it's a, a, a extreme, then we can always bring it back into our memory. back into our mind. And so, uh, this, is, this is why it is so uh, advisable to be, to be mindful and to, to live in a very careful way rather than just, just any old way. Just let life happen to you any old way. Uh, with that because you have to, if you do that, then you tend to do things that you regret later and that you will remember.
So memory can drive us crazy. We can go com- be completely neurotic, completely out of touch with anything real, just through remembering things. We can create things in our mind. We can fantasize. We can create a whole illusory world that no one else, most of our illusions, people share. I mean, society has a agreed, agreed upon certain illusions that we call normal, normality, a good citizenship, and so forth. But <laughs> then there are, so have private worlds. Uh, that so that we, we, we have a creative mind, don't we? We can create things with it. We can remember, we have the, the ability, we have memory, we have the creative we have imagination, we have memory, we have rationality and reason, logic, and we have intuition. And of those four, the intuitive side is, is, tends to be the least developed and the least understood in, the, in modern humanity. This is how I see it. The intuitive uh, mind is, tends to have been either rejected or if we're suspicious of it, we tend to think it, it's unreal or it's untrustworthy. So we want everything kind of labeled and put down as in, in categories in computerized systems, everything neatly f- filed away on floppy disks now, not in file cabinets, floppy disks, and uh, modern technology is, is allowing our dream to come true, order everything, put everything in a system, systematize everything, and, and that's wonderful, isn't it? We can have it all listed under the alphabet, everything in the whole universe will be under a to Z. What a what a success story that is, and and we'll have names for everything. Uh, we'll we'll be able to we'll have we'll increase our intelligent our IQs our intelligent quotient by doing all kinds of things to our brains. Maybe taking certain pills and and certain kind of genes and and implants and and brain transplants, and <laughs> who knows what, just to increase our ability to, to retain more names and labels for everything, <laughs> and to be kind of, be more kind of immediate, uh, automatic in their delivery. So you push the button and blah, 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 like a computer. Uh, we, 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 we love creativity and imagination, isn't it? We think that's wonderful to, to be a creative artist, even though what we create isn't worth a hoot. <laughs> <laughs> and even would be best if you didn't bother, as far as the rest of the world is concerned. Because, I mean, oftentimes our imagine, what we imagine and create is, is uh, just from our conceit and our stupidity. So even our creativity is, is, uh, tends to take a, a form that I- is quite presumptuous and, and, uh, and conceited and self-centered. Like art now tends to, uh, ten- one sees the art world very much as a kind of full of conceited people who, who want to make a name for themselves. Uh, who really have to write their name on everything and say, this is my creation. Have exhibitions, say, these are my creations. And this is, this is mine, I've done all this. This is, aren't I creative? Aren't I talented? Because we can, we can uh, be quite skillful in the way we use things and so forth. But say, what would be creativity with wisdom? What would be intelligence and intellect, reason with wisdom, what would that be like? Would our memories be such irritating things to us if there was wisdom along with it? So, so contemplate that. Would, would these, these abilities we have, would they t- 
turn on, like they tend to turn on us and overwhelm us and drive us crazy or make us unhappy or discontented, when it's coming out of ignorance and self-conceit, even the most ta- the most creative talents suffer enormously if, if when it's coming from from a selfish intention. But then what would these be like if there's wisdom? And this is what we're what we're say contemplating on this retreat is how to bring wisdom into our lives. so that our memories are not just experiences of guilt and remorse and depression, so that our creativity can, can can be of great benefit to all sentient beings, so that our um, intelligence, our intellect, can, can not be just a source of uh, fault finding and comparing and blaming, but of of uh, being able to tell the the, tr- the real from the unreal, being able to discriminate the true from the false, the right from the wrong, as as we experience life, so that our discriminative faculties are working for us rather than against us. And then intuitively, this is developing this ability, this total sensitivity, because the intuition, if allowed if taken the personal, the personality out of the, the, the intuition, the idea that it's personal, then that is a connecting to universality. Because on the intuitive level, we're one. There's, no, there's not two. But on the level of memory and uh, imagination, and reason and logic, we, we're endlessly dividing everything up, and and, uh, and it it tends to make everything seem very separate, very alien to us. Very, we feel isolated and alienated and lonely through our attachment to these discriminative functions of the mind. And even even if we happen to be intuitive quite naturally intuitive, we tend to interpret it from the wrong view. So even intuition makes us super sensitive and we're we're easily being feeling everything too much. If you if you meet really intuitive people, they're they are all they suffer enormously because they they uh, are taking it all in the wrong way. They they tend to to pick up and feel everything and then then See, interpret it in a in a in a selfish way. So they become, you know, they're super sensitive and uh, suffer from from all kinds of things that people who aren't intuitive would never even notice or feel. But it's through the the this intuitiveness or mindfulness, awareness, wisdom. That we and that the, there is no suffering, and it's always immediate. Whenever there's mindfulness, there's no suffering. Whenever there's heedlessness, there is suffering. Right now, one heedless moment, there's suffering. Mindful moment, no suffering. But I don't expect you to believe it. This is for your contemplation, so that you can actually apply this to your own experience of uh, of. Uh, as you begin to uh, develop your practice, you you contemplate this, and when when there is when there's mindfulness, awareness, and use of wise recollection, I can't find any suffering in my mind at all. Not a speck. But then. And I get carried away with something. I start, oh, I can't stand. Oh, I don't like that. And oh, oh and this, and he, you're suffering again, tomato. <laughs> <laughs> and you, at least you, when you practice, you begin to to uh, develop the way of non-suffering because there isn't. 
ultimately there's no suffering at all. There is no such thing as suffering. It's all, it's, it's based on illusion. But it's through, through investigating the illusory, the, the suffering that we, we believe in and we react to and we identify with that we understand it, let it go, realize non-suffering. That's the, the sequence. Through understanding suffering, we let it go and then we realize non-suffering. So that the Buddha aimed his, his point, investigate suffering, understand it, and through that you let go of it. And through letting go of suffering, you realize non-suffering. So I'll end my talk this evening. Um.